we're in a series entitled Survivor. Man, that's uh, sure fitting, uh, like we talked about all of the things that we've survived the last couple years. Man, it seems like COVID has been around for years and years, right? It really hasn't been that long. It just seems like it's taken forever to get through it. But when you think of, of surviving or a survivor, a question has to be asked in my mind, um, and I think in yours too, why do we survive? What, what makes someone go through some of the things they go through? I mean, we always wonder, you know, why did that person do that? Why does he stay with her? Why does she stay with him, right? Why could they not get off the island, right? They had every creature comfort in the world, but they couldn't make a boat and get off the island. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. You can Google it and find out on your own, right? Some of the things I tried to figure out why people survived, why they make it through the things they do. Some people want to prove themselves and show everyone else they can do it. There's a sense of pride, right? You're not going to beat me. You're not going to defeat me. I'm going to show you I can accomplish this thing that you don't think I can do. I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I asked my son why he didn't go on and play basketball in college, and he just told us, "Ah, I just did it and excelled because I wanted to prove all the people that told me I wasn't good enough to play that I could. He done what he wanted. Ah, basketball's not a big deal anymore. But that, that was his motivation to survive. You know, we bounced from place to place as I was, you know, being a pastor and taking on different ministries. And every time he'd be the new guy, and the new guy doesn't see the floor much. And he decided he was going to prove himself, and he did. But, but that was his motivation. For, for some people, other people are their motivation to get through it. Maybe you're one of those people. You're more concerned about your kids, about your spouse, about everyone else than you are yourself. You know, a lot of people have this motivation, especially when they're going through cancer or something like that, a prolonged disease, MS, um, stuff like that. They think of other people, and they're going to last as long as they can for them. You know, some people survive and go through these hard situations simply because they know nothing else. Their life seems to always have been one trial, one thing to overcome right after another. And you're like, how do you endure all these things that come into your life? And they'll just look at you and say, I I don't know anything else. I I don't know how to do anything else than to just keep on plugging and get through this. You know, some people uh, and a lot of people that end up enduring hardships, the real reason they do it is they have a goal in mind. They have a goal in mind. Surviving is built into us. Whatever your reason may be, God put into us this instinct to want to survive, to to want to keep seeing another day. When the stresses of life, when sin entered the world and things just keep beating on us and beating on us, it's because of sin that some of us at, at the low point seem to think the best thing to do is just pass on. That's not natural. God built us to survive, to want to overcome. You know, you see it all the time. Many of you, as I think about our high school students getting ready to go on to college, and you go onto a college campus, and all these buildings have names, right? Why do those buildings have names? Because someone wanted you to remember they were here and they accomplished great things. Why do we have statues to remember someone's name and they did great things. It is built in us to leave a lasting legacy. Well, the Apostle Paul, his name was Saul, and it was changed. He started out persecuting the church. He was there when Stephen was stoned, the first martyr that we really see. And, it, and the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 9 that all the men laid their coats at his feet while they were stoning Stephen. Saul, at that time, He goes and he gets documents from the religious leaders who also were political leaders. And they gave him permission to travel around and find the people that associated themselves with the way, with with this new teaching that Jesus Christ had come and that he was the Messiah. They told him, I want you to go round up these people, persecute them till they they, uh, renounce Jesus as the true Messiah. And if you have to kill them, eh, so be it. He was on his way to Damascus when God intervened, when Jesus 
literally intervened. He saw the glorified Lord in front of him. Those that were with him heard the conversation between the Lord and Paul, I mean, excuse me, Saul, but they could not see the glorified Lord. As a result of his encounter with the glorified Lord, Paul could not see. You want to talk about a, a strike to someone. I don't know about you, you know, if I lost an arm or a leg, man, that'd be terrible. I could probably get on with my life. But if you can't see, think about that. If I can't see, I now am totally unreliant on other people. Totally. Paul, I mean, excuse me, Saul was hit right in where he lived in his pride when Jesus took away his sight. But God had a big mission for him, so he sent him to Ananias. Ananias knew of Saul, knew of his reputation. And we find in Acts chapter 9, verse 13, it says, but when God, when uh, the Lord showed up and told Ananias, I want you to go meet with, with Saul, restore his vision because I have great things for him. Here's what Ananias said. He says, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many about this man and much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. In other words, I know what Saul's done. I know what he did in Jerusalem. Why should I go and, find, and search out and find trouble? Basically is what Ananias is saying. Are you wanting me to die? Verse 14, and here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go for he is chosen instrument of mine. Notice that. He says, Saul is a chosen instrument of mine. To carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Verse 16, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Saul is healed, and he begins to immediately go to the synagogues and preach the name of Jesus. But as he does that, he makes enemies of the very Jews that he once aligned himself with. And it's not, we're not given the time lane, whether it's days or whether it's weeks, but it isn't very long, and they have a plot to destroy Saul, to come after him. Later, in Acts chapter 9, you find later in the chapter that the disciples, those who, who believed his testimony and called on Christ to be their Savior, they were so afraid that they were going to grab Saul and kill him like Stephen was killed that they took him in a basket to the corner of the city walls. Those walls, again, were multiple stories. They tied a rope on the basket and lowered Paul now down to the ground to safety. You know, it's almost immediately that that prophecy that God told Ananias about Paul became true. Days, weeks after his conversion to follow the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he is persecuted. He is cut off from the people that he once called his tribe, his people, his family. And he is running for his life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, actually the whole book of 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to defend his name. False prophets have came in. They said, you know what? We're the ones who truly know Jesus Christ, and we're the ones that truly know the way. Paul's finally had enough. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 21b, Paul says, let me tell you about my credentials. You think their credentials are lofty. You think they graduated from a prestigious university. Let me tell you about me. He says, but well, whatever anyone else dares boast, 2 Corinthians 11, 21b, I am speaking as a fool. In other words, I'm going to talk like them. Paul's not calling himself a fool. He's saying this is foolish, but I'm going to do it because I want to prove to you that I am qualified to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, I also dare to boast of that. Verse 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. They came in saying, hey, we're the real Israelites. We're the real Jews. Verse 23, are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. And then he puts in there again, I am talking like a madman. Paul says, why do I have to tell this to you? Especially since he was the one 
that had led many of them to a saving faith in Jesus Christ and what he had done on the cross. He says, this is lunacy that I have to keep going my, through, through my credentials with you. But let me carry on, even though I sound like a madman, with far greater labors for more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times, he says, I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Well, why did they only give 39 lashes? Well, they had an abacus and only had 39 beads on it. No. For whatever reason, their tradition was if you gave them 40 lashes and they didn't die from their beating, the person that gave them those lashes, they were innocent before God. But if you gave 41 lashes, in other words, that was the line too far. If you gave them 41 lashes and they ended up dying from their beating, your life would be required of you. So when Saul says, when Paul says they gave me 39 all these times, they would always stop one short to make sure that they didn't cross the line. He says five times I did that. He goes on three times. I was beaten with rods which, by the way, was illegal for a Roman citizen to receive that punishment. But three times he was beaten by Romans with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. Not only was I shipwrecked, one of those times, you know, he did his whole Titanic thing and held on to driftwood, right? And sang an amazing song that was videoed for all of them to see. Verse 26, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people. Sounds like Cherokee County, doesn't it? Danger from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false prophets. Feel like that robot, right? Danger, danger, danger. There's just danger everywhere. Paul is telling them, Look at what I've done. You guys already knew my testimony, but look what I've endured. If I'm a false prophet, why in the world would I go through all of that? Verse 27, he continues on. In toil and hardships, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and notice verse 28, and apart from other things, there is daily pressure on me for my anxiety for all of the churches. Now, I don't think this is one that needs to be jumped over. And, I, and it's always hard for pastors or those in church leadership to talk about ourselves. But, but if you don't understand the pressure that is on an elder, a pastor, a deacon to care about a church, then you don't understand the calling of being a church leader. He says, all of these things that were happening to my physically, he said, that doesn't compare to, to my personal struggle and my mental struggle worrying about the churches that I had started and about the people God brought into my path. Guys, if you don't have a church leader, a Sunday school teacher, a, a small group leader that cares enough about you to cry with you, to celebrate with you, and even sometimes to get in your face and go, what are you thinking? If they don't care enough about you to care that deeply about you, then you're in the wrong church and you're in the wrong life group. Here at Keys, we do our best to try and care about people. We don't have a fancy website. It's not that we don't try. We don't have one right now. Colin's working on it. He'll get to it. But we believe that God has called us to care for people. We believe that ministry is not about how many times we fill up the baptistry and put people through it. We care about that because every life matters to God. Our Bible tells us that he is willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. See, just because you went through the water doesn't mean that you're following Christ. It means you took a bath in front of everybody with clothes on, right? Guys, it's the life afterwards that is hard, and that's what Paul is trying to get them to understand. Anyone can say I'm a Christian. They can wear the T-shirts, maybe even get a nice tattoo. Who knows? But actually following Christ takes, takes a life commitment. It takes endurance to be a survivor. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 30, this is where Paul, this is where you have your, uh, excuse me, 1 verse 20. This is what you have on, your, on the front of your bulletin. 
He tells the Philippian church, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as in always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. See, Paul promised them that he would come back to the church, but he has been delayed. Whether it's through being arrested, whether it's through being shipwrecked, almost killed, almost stoned to death, they thought he was dead. The men of the church of that area gathered around him outside of that town, and Paul awoken, they tended to him, and he carried on his journey. He had been delayed getting back to them, and he tells them, I want you to understand, if you've heard that I almost died, it's true. But he says, whether by life or by death, I want to honor Christ. He says in verse 21, that verse a lot of us know, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, in other words, if I am to stay here on this earth, that means fruitful labor for me. Guys, if you are breathing, if you are alive today, God is not through with you and your job is fruitful labor. I don't know what fruitful labor looks like to you. Everyone's ministry, everyone's calling is differently because God made each one of us unique. But God has a plan for your life. You are to produce something. Fruitful labor is the reason we are alive. If it were not the case, at the moment that we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, why didn't he just take us into heaven? Right? If that's the goal, then why weren't we just raptured into heaven? Because there is a further goal, and we are to have a fruitful labor honoring God here on this earth. Paul says, hey, if I'm still alive, he's got a job for me to do. Yet, which I choose, I cannot tell. In other words, Paul goes, you know what? There are times I'd rather be dead. When I'm getting hit by large stones, I don't know about you, I'd rather be somewhere else. Right? When you're getting whipped, I'd probably rather be someone else somewhere else. And Paul goes, you know what? I know if I die, I know where I'm going to be. Woo, no more whippings, no more shipwreckings, right? No more snakes coming out of the rocks and biting my hand, right? He he can avoid all of that if he would just be in glory with his Savior. But he says, you know what? I I don't know what I need to do. He says in verse 23, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. I don't want you to raise your hand because some of you probably don't know. Do you know right now, if you died, that you would be far better off? If you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, you better say no. Because our Bible is clear that if you die without accepting Him as your Savior, there's no second chance. Eternity is now for you going to be with the place that was prepared for the devil, not for you. See, hell was meant to hold the devil and his demons, not for those that were made in the image and likeness of of God. Christian, if you're not to the place yet in your life, in your maturity with Christ, that you don't understand that if you close your eyes, whoo, I'm in glory, it's all over. You got to wonder, man, Am I really understanding this Christian life right? Well, pastor, that seems mean. Don't, what about my family? I, I know. The longer you grow in Christ, the more you get in his word, the more you understand and how much little control you have. Those of you that have little kids, as they grow older, the more you will understand, the less control you have. Those of you that are married, I don't need to explain it to you. You know. God is the one who's in control. If I'm here, God wants to use me. If I'm not here, God's going to take care of my family. He's going to take care of this ministry. Whatever it is that I think I'm leaving behind, I'm not leaving near as much behind as I'm going to gain when I'm in heaven. I should have got a shout even from the Baptist right there. Let's try that again. No matter how much I have here on earth, it's nowhere near what I'm going to gain when I'm in heaven. Now you're alive, just making sure. Notice verse 24, even though we just talked about how great heaven is, notice where Paul lands. He says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Paul is telling the Philippians, one reason that I don't quit, one reason that when my back, when I'm losing blood, when they're hitting me with stones, one of the reasons that I keep trying to keep my consciousness and I don't just roll over and die is because I know that I have a spiritual wisdom to impart to you. He goes, I want to stay here for you. 
convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul understood the mission. Oh, I want to be in heaven, but if I'm still here, he wants me to work on that mission so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming again to you. Paul said, when I come to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about all the things that you help fund. I'm going to tell you about the churches that were started, and I'm going to encourage you in your walk and your growth in the Lord Jesus Christ when I come back to you. Paul clarifies his mission. Paul clarifies his goal later on in Philippians chapter 3. The goal that kept Paul pressing on, the, the goal that made Paul the survivor that he was is found in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, some of you that are more on the Arminian scale leaning, you may think, well, see right there, we've got to earn our salvation. That's not what he's talking about. How do I know? Read everything in context. What does he say next? Not that I have already obtained this or that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Guys, if you are surviving because of your own pride, I'll show everyone how good a Christian I am. You've got the wrong motivation. The reason we survive is because Christ Jesus made us his own. The reason I will enter heaven is because Christ Jesus made me his own. The reason my family is healthy, and that I'm provided for it day by day is because Christ Jesus made me his own. The reason when my family is not healthy, when cancer is racking my body, whatever it is going through my body, that I am, am having that issue is because Christ Jesus made me his own. Well, how can you say that, Pastor? Because I know that God has a plan. And I already read to you several times that if I'm still alive and I'm still kicking, he ain't through with me. How many times did Paul tell him, hey, you know what? I'm in chains, but you got to know this, that the whole Roman garrison is hearing about Jesus Christ because of what I'm telling these guards while they're chained to me. Guys, that's a testimony. You, you, you don't realize the testimony you have even when you're in a hospital stricken with whatever disease you're fighting by the attitude you conduct yourself with while you're going through that pain. I still remember the German doctor that came into mine into my room day after day when i was going through my stem cell transplant and i got an infection in my stomach i couldn't eat look at me do i look like i hate not to eat that was worse than anything couldn't even have candy it was bad but as she kept coming in day after day how are you feeling today mr wolf well if i die i'm gonna be better off but if i'm here i'm gonna keep pressing on i said that for probably eight days till her rotation was done I wanted her to know, I'm not afraid if I die. But you know what? If I'm here, all right, bring on the pain. That doesn't mean I didn't keep asking for pain pills and ask for relief. But guys, whatever God had for my life, I knew that he had my life in his hand and he would sustain me. Notice, let's keep going there in Philippians 3, verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. Again, it's not of his power. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I strain forward to what lies ahead. This is a lesson for all of us that are over 21 years of old, of age. Okay, maybe 30. Do you remember when you're young and you're like, I just want to be older, right? Even at 21, no one listens to me. Well, you're right, no one listens to you. When, they, when you're 30, they can hear you. At 40, they're consider you. At 50, now they listen. I know you don't like it. I'm just telling you my life experience. And it was in a book I read once. When I was 25, and I said, that's bull crap. No, it was true, right? Some of us want to live in the past, though. Some of us always talk about what used to be. A lot of churches get stuck in the past. And because of that, they're dying. You know, we used to do this, and people would come in. Yeah. You know what else we used to do? We used to blow on cakes and blow out those little fires on top, and then all of us would eat it, right? 
We need to get back to those days, I think. But I'm going to give you a cupcake, and you can blow out the candle. I'm going to have my own cupcake. But we used to do stuff. It doesn't mean that it, we can still do it now and it be effective or that it's better. He says, I remember the past, the good times, the bad times, but I keep pressing on. Guys, if our best days as a church was behind us, why are we here today? God has a mission for us. He says, I am going to keep pressing on. That goal is not a reached. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, until he calls me home, I'm pressing. Now, We have a lot of Christians that stand. You know the difference between standing or sitting and pressing? One of them takes energy. The other one's just a bump on a log. Guys, the encouragement from Paul, the reason he survived all of the stuff that came into his life, that long list we had in 2 Corinthians, is because he kept pressing toward the goal, toward the prize. Let those of us Notice verse 15. Here's a little slap in the face to all of us. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything, excuse me, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. In other words, Paul was encouraging, hey, if you're mature in Christ, you understand this principle. That your best days are not behind you, your best days are in front of you. Did you get that? See, some of us as Christians have become so worldly-minded that we forget that our best days are in front of us. My best day here on earth, if I shoot a 62 on the golf course, go out and never miss a quail or a pheasant when I hunt, if I shoot hundreds when I qualify for the sheriff's department, whatever your best day is, your motorcycle starts right even, you just put the key in, you didn't have to push the starter, just start it. Your wife made your favorite meal for you, right? Your kids brought your slippers. Well, whatever it is, your perfect day. Guys, that is nowhere comparing to what eternity will be like for us. The entire book of Revelation is written for us to understand that what we do here on earth is just warm up for what eternity is going to be. I saw this this morning and grabbed it. I'm like, man, this is exactly what I'm trying to get to in my message this week. It says this. It's from Dallas Willard, a quote from him. The gospel is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die and more about how to live in the kingdom of heaven before you die. See, even some of us in the way that we share our faith, we try and get people out of hell instead of understanding that God wants to prepare us for eternity. You see, God in the process, after we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, it's this process called sanctification. It's not that we get more saved. It's that we become more and more like Jesus Christ. So when the, when the millennial reign of Christ comes, when the tribulation comes, and, and I'm pre-trib until I miss it and then I'm mid-trib, and, it, and if I miss the mid-trib, I'm just in trouble. I'm going to tell you right now. Those are things that, guys, they're not going to keep me out of heaven. I know where I stand. If you come on Wednesday nights, you hear I'm telling you why I stand where I stand. But, but the Bible tells us that the church of Jesus Christ, for that millennial reign, is going to rule and reign with Christ. We are preparing for what's going to, what we're going to be like for eternity. I am thankful that accepting Jesus and what he did on that beautiful, terrible cross saves me from hell but we should be more thankful about the future that's ahead of us. Man, if I understand how great heaven is, how Jesus, think about this. Jesus has been gone for how many years? 2,000 plus? If it's taken Jesus 2,000 years to build our mansions, our rooms, it's not mansions, it says rooms. We say mansions because that sounds better. But if it's taking 2,000 years for him to prepare this place for us, man, How amazing do you think it is? It's worth it. Every trial that comes into your life, every good time in your life that comes into your life that that you may want to grab a hold of and not progress forward, there are people that do that. Guys, all of that stuff is here to prepare us for eternity. We may not understand it now, but we have a loving Father that promises us all of this 
will be worth it. Father, I want to thank you for the encouragement of your word. I want to thank you that um, the examples you give us, uh, like the last few weeks, we've seen flawed men and we'll see flawed women who, who still endured, who survived, and you did amazing things with their life. Help us, because we are fallen humans, when we keep looking around at this world and forgetting that we have a higher goal, that this earth is not our home, that heaven is our future. It truly should radically change the way we think, the way we act, the way we prioritize things in our lives. Father, the example of Saul, some of us would say, well, I've never murdered anyone in church. Some would say, I've never persecuted the church. How can I identify with Paul? Well, I just spent 35 minutes trying to explain how we need to have the right focus. Otherwise, our life is not going to make sense. If there's Christians here that have been struggling, the hardships aren't making sense to them, and they truly are just taking one day, one minute at a time to get through it, Father, your Holy Spirit is the best comforter we have. Father, if there's someone here that when we talked about holding on to the past, they need to realize their future is more important and brighter than their past ever is, Father, make that real to them. Father, but if there's some soul here that doesn't know, I mean know, that if they died today, they would wake up in eternity with you, Father. Help them not to leave this room without grabbing one of us and asking us about salvation. Father, I want to pray over your church. Not just the church here, but the church throughout the country, throughout the world. Father, we live in a depressing, despairing time. We live in a pressing time. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would make alive your church so that a dark, dying world can't help but see the difference in our life. Because that's what you said. That the world would see and be drawn to your church by the way we care for one another. Father, help us not to be a country club. Help us to be an effective hospital, an effective ministry to the communities where you've planted us. Father, the invitation time, as always, is yours. There's no cool words we can say to make people respond. Your Holy Spirit has to move. We give it to you. In your name we pray. Amen.